And again, looking at normal values for this child, we find peak velocity, well, yes, that's normal. Cardiac output, that's normal. <coughs> Cardiac index, that too is normal. Heart rate, minute distance, stroke volume, all normal. The only one that's slightly worrying is the systemic vascular resistance. This child is slightly vasoconstricted. Well, that would be consistent with a child who's been vomiting, not eating or drinking, and has been hot. So it's just she needs a little fluid, but it doesn't show any other evidence of septicemia. Which was actually very good news indeed, because this is my favorite OSCOM data set because this child is my granddaughter. I think I set a new land speed record driving from home to the emergency department to do this OSCOM. But being serious for a moment, next time you want to discharge a child who's a little miserable and unwell from ED, wouldn't you like to know their hemodynamics are normal before you do that? Just a quick question. What is the biggest single killer of children under 16 years of age worldwide? Well, the answer may surprise you, but it's actually hypovolemic shock, be it from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, trauma, multi-origin, multi but it's hypovolemic shock. It's killing millions of our children every year. The path to the grave, as they call it, um, Typically, clinicians look at heart rate, capillary refill, consciousness level, but these can all be very misleading, particularly in the early and intermediate stages. Blood pressure can be totally unreliable. By the time it falls, the patient is in serious danger. The really worrying fact is that 50% of senior clinicians in the emergency department miss the diagnosis until the child is an extremist. But two factors give us consistent and accurate indications of the real situation, stroke volume and SVR. Let's have a look at some very new data that we've just produced. In the surviving sepsis campaign, I'm sure you're all aware, the advice is that children with sepsis and sepsic, septic shock should be resuscitated with large volumes of intravenous fluid. The standard seems to be around 40 mils per kilo body weight. Some would suggest that 60 mils per kilo body weight is more appropriate. Some say give 20 mil aliquots repeatedly until the child improves. So let's have a little look at some septic children and let's look at their hemodynamics. This child is 23 kilos. The stroke volume was 23 mils. So Stroke volume on admission, one mil per kilo. In response to fluid, we see the stroke volume going up and up, and the child does well. And we still see increases between 40 mils per kilo and 60 mils per kilo, although it's relatively small. Most of it has occurred by 40 mils per kilo. Second child, in response to fluid, the stroke volume goes exactly as we would hope. Third child, again, the stroke volume is above one mil per kilo on admission, and in response to fluid, we see continued improvement. But here, we can still see improvement between 40 and 60 mils. These children are known as responders. They respond to IV fluid. But what about the other side of the coin? This child, stroke volume is below one mil per kilo on admission, already worrying. In response to fluid, the stroke volume declined and the child died. Second child, very low stroke volume on admission, well under one mil per kilo. And in response to fluid, there was further deterioration and death. These children are called non-responders. Now, have we seen curves of this kind of shape before? Well, I think we have.
Where have we seen those? Well, of course, Starling showed us this. Could it be that the responders are on this type of curve, whereas the non-responders are already somewhere here? And in response to fluid, these children decline further with a falling stroke volume. In other words, are the non-responders dying of cardiac failure? Well, if that's the case, we know how to get them off this curve and back up here somewhere. What we need is inotropy. So let's take a look. Further child admitted, low stroke volume under 1 mil per kilo. In response to 30 mils per kilo of fluid, we have no increase in stroke volume. At this point, we commence dobutamine at 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute. What happened? Well, suddenly, we have a responder. Second child, again, very low stroke volume on admission and clearly going down with fluid. At this point, we commence dobutamine 15 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And again, we turn a non-responder into a responder. That's just simply what Starling told us 80 years ago. Now, the OSCOM can be used not just on children, pregnant mothers, as we've seen, large football players. It can be used on anybody. It's non-invasive. It can be used anywhere, the doctor's office, the ED, the ward, the operating theater, anywhere you care to take it. Now, when I was training in intensive care, I was always taught that patients don't die with normal numbers. They die with abnormal numbers. And we were always told to try and put the numbers back to normal. Now, normalizing the numbers, as we called it back in the 1980s, is today known by a different name. It's called goal-directed therapy. Now, I'm sure you've all read this seminal paper by Manny Rivers and Brian Newen and co. of early goal-directed therapy in the treatment of severe sepsis and septic shock. Now, what they showed was that optimizing hemodynamics saves lives. Now, Manny Rivers is extremely honest in admitting that they tried to optimize hemodynamics in under six hours, but admits they often took longer. Nine hours was not uncommon. With the OSCOM, we normally optimize hemodynamics in RED in under 90 minutes, and we regularly do it in under 60 minutes, as you've seen. So I guess the take-home message would be not only does OSCOM take the guesswork out of hemodynamics, but it takes the delay out of hemodynamics as well. And it does it non-invasively, anywhere, anytime. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Brian.